Uh, what wonderful uh, welcome. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, uh, it was fun talking to Tom uh, earlier and thinking back to, uh, I, I know a number of you are undergrads and thinking back to being in the class of a guy named Martin Kilson, who was my favorite professor in college uh, in cold weather Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in many ways was the guy who encouraged me to go uh, the entrepreneurial route. But I would love to share with you guys a little bit of what has taken me on this journey. Some of the things I've learned, uh, good, bad, and other, and uh, some of the things I still wonder about um, because hopefully I've got a lot more ahead of me. And, uh, and then at some point I'll stop and would love to get questions um, uh, from those of you here. Uh, I often say I didn't start life off uh, headed down an entrepreneurial path. I probably was more likely to be a teacher. Uh, I like to joke that I'm related to more teachers than anyone you'll ever meet, uh, parents, uh, siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents. I come from a long line of teachers, and so that seemed much more likely. And in my family, there was a very earnest hope that I would become a lawyer. Uh, I know you know in many families, lawyers and doctors, uh, sometimes engineers, uh, are kind of particularly prized. And um, I think growing up, uh, um, uh, particularly for me in the 70s and 80s, there was a sense that uh, uh, lawyers often uh, did really good things, often were involved in important causes, had been a meaningful part of the civil rights movement, uh, Thurgood Marshall, who later became a Supreme Court justice. And so for my grandmother, who was from uh, Jackson, Mississippi, her, uh, her most fervent hope uh, was that her grandson, the one who used to break her chandeliers and cause trouble and make her wonder if she had one grandchild too many, um, she always hoped that I would go on to uh, become a lawyer. So um, uh, that was on the brain, uh, leaving teaching behind and maybe uh, going on to law school what was on my mind. But uh, my sophomore year, I took a course by a, a wonderful guy named Martin Kilson. And um, any of you by any chance have heard of Martin Kilson? Any chance? Um, Martin Kilson was uh, a wonderful professor uh, at Harvard. Uh, I was an undergraduate. Now, to look at him, you might confuse him uh, with a homeless gentleman. You may not, you may not know any different. He ha used to have a little kind of um, ragged hat that he would wear, and his clothes were always rumpled, and he couldn't seem to quite find his way. But I tell you what, Professor Kilson was one of the most thoughtful, interesting, um, eye-opening uh, people I ever met. And as I took his course, which interestingly enough was not an entrepreneurial course, but was actually a course on politics, uh, back, in the, um, uh, back in the fall of 1989, uh, Professor Kilson challenged me and lots of other students not just to think about law and politics, but to think about uh, becoming entrepreneurs. And uh, that doesn't seem very remarkable today, and that certainly probably doesn't sound very remarkable sitting here in Silicon Valley saying that to you, but sitting in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1989 and having this rumpled professor uh, say to, uh, to a group of students that included myself that as opposed to thinking about uh, the politics that we were so focused on that maybe part of the good change in the world might come from entrepreneurs was, uh, was really unusual. Entrepreneurialism wasn't as broad-based as sexy. There weren't incubators, there weren't accelerators. And so it was the first time that someone had put that in my mind. With that in my mind, I decided I wanted to learn more about it. And um, Harvard really didn't have undergraduate courses. And so I started to wander around. And I went to uh, the economics department and wanted to see if some of the professors there uh, would offer some kind of independent study or course. They said, nah, we won't do that over here. And so they sent me over to the business school. They said, nah, we won't do that. Interestingly enough, they sent me over to the Kennedy School of Government. They said, nah, we won't do that. They sent me back over to the business school. And as I was walking, uh, dejected from um, the offices of a, uh, of a nice guy who was the dean, Bill Salman, uh, who I don't know why he allowed this undergrad uh, in his office, but uh, I think he didn't know any better. I probably slipped in the door quickly. Um, he finally said, well, I have one other idea. There's this lecturer here um, who normally teaches at Babson. His name is Jeff Timmons. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, and maybe you should go talk to him. And man, oh man, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, uh, Jeff Timmons uh, uh, was an uh, entrepreneur who had done really well with the beginning of cellular phones and also the cable industry, who had decided to teach. And... Uh, Professor Timmons said, why not? Why not do an independent study? He mainly taught courses at Harvard Business School. And he said, why not allow this undergrad to do an independent study with me, to sit in on my classes, 
uh, visit lots of interesting businesses. And so uh, I began a little journey uh, with Professor Timmons. And uh, he would have me go and meet with different small business people, a t-shirt maker, guy who owned a couple of pizza shops, someone who owned a radio station, and ask him about the good, the bad, the ugly uh, when it came to entrepreneurship. And, uh, and that really was the first thing that, again, kind of took Professor Kilson's kind of a seed of an idea and took it further. And I think part of what I heard in the variety of people that I ended up talking uh, to was that it wasn't easy. And that was probably the most, uh, the most obvious thing. Um, go forward a little bit. Uh, I Graduating from college, I'm thinking, man, I would love to try something entrepreneurial. Uh, my dad, who as I told you, is a teacher. My mom was a teacher. He was not that excited about his boy with a Harvard degree <laughs> going to uh, do some kind of startup. That wasn't exactly uh, on his list of plans. And uh, I had this crazy idea that these students, anyone here ever eat buffalo wings? Before they were big, your friend said they were going to be big. <laughs> and my dad was like, nah, it's a bad idea. Don't do that. No one's ever going to eat them. Why would anyone want them delivered? And I was like, dad, I'm telling you, these things are great. You don't always want pizza. You know, these other things are good too. And um, uh, lo and behold, uh, for better or for worse, uh, he talked me out of it. Um, uh, it was a good lesson, though, um, um, and it's a lesson probably a lot of entrepreneurs learn, uh, which is that uh, a lot of times you're wrong, but sometimes you're right. And sometimes when you're right, not everyone's going to be able to see it right away. And um, while you've got to be thoughtful enough to listen, uh, you may not always follow even the advice of those closest to you, uh, namely your dad, uh, whose name you borrowed, because I'm Carlos Jr. So. Um, so now we are five or six years into it, and I still haven't really stepped out and done the entrepreneurial thing. Um, I do go to graduate school uh, here at Stanford and loved it. Uh, loved the sun, loved the people, loved the openness. Uh, this was kind of the early 90s, and so uh, while there still were um, um, memories and kind of legend and lore of, uh, of uh, uh, Hewlett Packard at the time and Steve Jobs and a handful of others, wasn't as, at least to my mind, as robust an entrepreneurial environment as there is today. And it wasn't immediately obvious that those opportunities were out there. Not just for kind of entrepreneurial opportunities, but even I remember when one of my buddies who graduated in the mid-90s got a job in venture capital uh, right out of business school that was considered quite unusual. So uh, the environment, in my mind, wasn't as rich and as interesting. But I still, I had thoughts in my mind that I wanted to do something, but I took a safer route um, and decided to go work at McKinsey and Company. Uh, any McKinsey or ex-McKinsey folks here? Okay, this one, yep, a couple, a couple good folks. Uh, and so uh, that was a wonderful opportunity. It was unusual because I was coming from law school, so I wasn't part of the business school tribe, but I was um, uh, one of the folks who came from science or medicine or one of the other places. In my case, it was law. And as, as I went into it, a good friend stopped me and she, she said, you have to promise me that you're not gonna stay longer than two years. She said, I know you wanna do something entrepreneurial and I know if you get in there and you don't go in with the mindset that this is limited, you'll end up looking up and it'll be 10 years, 20 years later. And so that was another tick um, along the way. So I go into McKinsey and actually she helped me a lot in saying that because I went into McKinsey not just wanting um, uh, to do a good job in general because I'm my mother's son and uh, that's what she wants you to do. Um, but, um, but also because I started to think about it more practically. I started to think the better I was for my clients, maybe one day the better I would be in advising uh, uh, myself and my partners uh, and my investors on how to make whatever I started grow. So again, slowly these things are building up in my head and I'm spending time uh, at McKinsey, wonderful opportunities, some here, some overseas. Um, Finally, in the, uh, uh, in the later 90s, I decided to go for it. And uh, along with a, uh, a good friend from college and one of my sisters, um, I decided to start an education company uh, called Achieva. And actually, I take that back. It wasn't called Achieva. Originally, it was called Sierra. It was called uh, Sierra College Prep Services. And uh, why Sierra? Sierra just sounded peaceful. It sounded like uh, someone who could bring you joy. Um, we ended up changing the name because it didn't make sense to anyone. But, um, but at least at the time we started. And uh, as I, the way I ended up doing it, I spent a bunch of time uh, thinking about it, writing a business plan, um, putting all that 
uh, together. And then with that, I went to go talk to a guy who had kind of become one of my mentors. And he was a super wonderful guy um, named Mark Jones. Uh, have any of you heard of Eris, a wonderful Internet of Things company? Uh, if you don't know Eris, not only is it a wonderful company, but it's run by one of the most wonderful people in the world, Mark Jones. I get teased all the time for saying everyone's nice, but Mark is certifiably the nicest guy who's ever been created. So, um, uh, But Mark, I went to go see Mark to tell him a little bit about this idea uh, that I had for a college prep company. And Mark listened dutifully, asked a couple of tough, penetrating questions, and then Mark went away. I was like, where did he go? Because he kind of disappeared a little bit abruptly. And when he came back, uh, he came back with a check. He came back with a check for $15,000. And uh, I realize that to some of you, that won't sound like very much. But uh, for this kid from Miami uh, back in 1996, that was a huge vote of confidence. And Mark said, you know, he said, uh, Mark came from kind of a similar family of teachers. And he said, I know how hard it is for someone like you to think about walking away from a McKinsey paycheck to start something. And if I can be a little bit of an encourager along the way, if I can be one of the people who pushes you further down the road, then I want to do it. So Mark handed over that check. He didn't say this was a loan. He didn't say, I want X, Y, and Z for it. He said, go forth and do the best you can. And so at that moment, I was committed. I was, uh, I was into it. The next call went to my favorite uncle. Um, I have uh, a wonderful uncle who looks just like my dad uh, and has the ability to be more fun because uh, he didn't have to put up with uh, my problematic side. And uh, I called my Uncle Dunbar, who had never gone to college. My Uncle Dunbar passed up college so that his other two brothers, which included my dad, could go to college. And um, he worked at the equivalent of, uh, worked at a big oil company for 40 years as a technician. And um, when I called Uncle Dunbar and told him what I was thinking about doing, he, uh, and at the time, I just, I was not smart enough to really understand and appreciate what he did. Uh, but Uncle Dunbar uh, had about $100,000 in his 401k, and he wired the whole thing uh, to me um, and, uh, and to my sister. And, uh, and that was his whole savings. That was, that was everything. And, uh, and, and, uh, and he wired it to me uh, um, a couple days later. And so with that, uh, my uh, good friend and my sister and I thought, we're on to something. We're about to win. This is going to be good. And, um, uh, and we began what ended up becoming a, uh, a five, five and a half uh, year journey, which uh, was uh, neither as, uh, as easy as maybe I would have thought um, um, uh, uh, and not as straightforward. Uh, lots of interesting surprises, but we ended up building uh, a nice company, Achieva College Prep Services, that helped high school students prepare for college. So not just the SAT prep, but what college should I go to? How am I going to pay for it? Uh, what are these things called essays that they want? Who do you ask for a letter of recommendation? Offering all that kind of advice in a comprehensive way via software, books, and workshops, not just to individual families, but ultimately to big school districts like Miami and Chicago, Detroit, and others. Um, uh, we ended up selling it uh, years later to the Washington Post, which owns Kaplan and a bunch of other uh, education companies as well. Um, but it became a big part of my learning, uh, um, a big part of my growth, a big part of, of kind of shaping, uh, shaping who I was. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in just a minute and hopefully tie a number of these things together. Uh, while uh, at Achieve, I was on TV a couple of times and uh, talking about Achieve and what we were doing. And so I got a random call from a guy named Elliot one day who said, in effect, he left a voicemail and he said, uh, I saw you on TV, wondered if you'd ever think about uh, doing more of that. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, what they call development. Uh, would you consider talking to us? Well, I didn't believe Elliot was real. He called a couple of times. And that's because I have a very good friend named Rachel. And what Rachel loves to do in this life, and Rachel, if you're watching, I'm talking about you. Um, Rachel loved to play pranks on me. Back in the day, Rachel lived in LA. And she would have people call me and say, is this Carlos? Yeah. Were you just at this party in Hollywood? Yeah. Look, we've got this new movie coming out. We need someone to star opposite Halle Berry. We think you'd be great. Do you want to have breakfast tomorrow? And of course, 
I was dumb enough to say, oh, sure, of course you're calling me. Of course I'm ready to do this. And Rachel would call back a few minutes later and say, hey, you want to have breakfast? I'm like, I can't have breakfast. I got something for it. She's like, why? Because you're talking to someone who sounded like this? And so, and so I just assumed this guy, Elliot, was just another uh, Rachel prank. Uh, I ended up talking to Rachel, and uh, it turns out that this time, it's not her. And I got so upset with her. I said, see, you've caused so many problems over the years that I'm now looking gift horse in the mouth. Uh, uh, luckily, the guy called back, ended up having an interesting conversation, and I ended up um, a couple months, maybe a year later, uh, beginning what became an interesting career in television, first starting out as a guest host. Uh, I don't know if you guys know it, but it turns out that there are groups of people who work for TV networks that are scouting for talent all the time and often look for people who done guest appearances and think, could you do more? Could you do more as a talk show host? Could you do more as a regular host, what have you? And so I ended up spending much of the next several years in television at CNN, at MSNBC, um, doing various kinds of shows, often kind of interview shows, and really, uh, really enjoyed it. Um, but uh, a few years ago, um, sadly, while I was in the midst of that and living in New York, uh, my mom got really sick. And... Um, uh, she was living here, and um, and so uh, after uh, a little bit of back and forth, uh, I um, I left that and came to move out here to take care of her. And um, and while uh, I had never had anyone in my life who had uh, I was really close to who had um, uh, um, who had gotten that sick, she got she had late stage cancer, and um, and. Uh, and so it, probably for the first time, I, and I don't know if any of you are like this, but I definitely, for whatever reason, assumed I was going to live a super long time. My, mom, uh, uh, my mom's mom had lived to 102. Uh, both of her grandmothers had basically lived to 100. And we used to always joke that she was going to live to 125. I was going to get to a buck 50. And uh, we all were going to uh, go quite the distance. So I was, uh, as was she, was obviously surprised um, when it turned out that uh, 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 it turned out that she was sick, and um, and so it really made me, and I realize this will sound a little hokey, but it definitely made me uh, rethink life a little bit. It definitely made me appreciate that uh, it may not go as long as I expect, uh, that it could uh, end sooner uh, than I know, and so it really kind of pushed me to ask, what would I love to do? What would uh, what would bring great joy? Uh, what might I be good at? And so began uh, doing a fair amount of uh, soul searching. And she was part of it. I was uh, often driving her to doctor's appointments and uh, starting to think, and she would pepper me. She ever the teacher. She was a teacher, as I said, for kind of 40 plus years, teaching everything from kindergarten to college. And she would pepper me with questions about what do you really want to do? What do you love? And I realized that, that there still for me was a hunger and a desire um, uh, to do another startup. Uh, that as much as I had learned uh, and enjoyed uh, Achieva, um, and as hard as I'd worked, and as uh, many hours as I'd put in, and as much weight as I'd gained, um, working seven days a week uh, for uh, five and a half, six years straight, uh, that I wanted in again. And I wanted in with something that I really cared a lot about, which for me, I had always, I think in no small part because of my dad, I'd love the news. And I'd love figuring out what was going on. And it was less just an intellectual exercise of knowing kind of what's happening when, and more, my dad always introduced you to the news, whether you were listening to it, watching it, reading it, as a way to kind of expand your sense of what you could do. And so when he would read something in the paper or hear something on the news, he would translate it to that conversation you were having with your buddy Billy or that school project you had or that thing you told him you wanted to do. And so I started to think about where the news was uh, at that point, which was a couple of years ago, and I found that I didn't love it as much. I found that it would become a little, hmm, a little predictable in a lot of cases, meaning that whatever the handful of big stories were around the world would be the same story you'd see in most publications. And so even though I had more choices uh, digitally in terms of uh, where I'd get my news from than I did as a kid, I found that often they were repeating or emphasizing the same four or five stories. And so I started to think, what would different look like? What would magical look like? And I started on a journey of talking to folks at HuffPo and Vox and BuzzFeed and the New York Times and NPR and other places. But then in LaGuardia Airport, I bumped into a wonderful guy named David Neeleman. Uh, any of you 
Ever hear of David Neilman? He knew. Did he? David Neilman, the founder of uh, JetBlue, um, and also, I guess, Azul uh, now. Um, any of you guys ever fly JetBlue back in the day? I loved JetBlue when it first came out. I, uh, and I remember meeting uh, David Neilman in the airport and, uh, and saying to him, uh, Mr. Neilman, how did you make an, an airline that I have an emotional reaction to? that I actually love, that I kind of look forward to, that I go out of my way to fly, you guys. I'll change the time I'm going to fly. I'll change the location from which I'm flying. How did you do that? And he said, Carlos, I spent a lot of time uh, studying the business. In fact, he'd started an airline before JetBlue that he'd sold to Southwest Airlines. He said, but in the end, I kind of trusted my gut and what I loved a little bit. And so here was a guy who was kind of slightly tall, not super tall, tired of having his knees banged and made sure that everyone had a little more room. And I can't remember how many kids he had, but he said, Carlos, you know what happens? 10. Um, he said, Carlos, you know what happens when you have that many kids? You know what you want more than anything else? I said, what? He said, TV time. And so I don't know if you guys remember, but JetBlue was the first to put TVs on the back of everyone's uh, thing. So I say that only to say that part of what David Neeleman did for me was say that as I started to think about trying to reimagine the news, as I started to say that as much as I loved the New York Times or NPR or USA Today or any of the other places I'd gone a lot to, if I really was going to think about trying to creatively reimagine it, it wouldn't just be doing a McKinsey um, competitor research review. That in part it would be kind of following my heart and asking uh, myself and maybe others I trusted, what would you love? What would make you uh, break habits and start to try something new? And so as much research as we did, my uh, partner Samir and I, a wonderful guy named Samir Rao, uh, decide, okay, let's stop and actually ask ourselves that question. What would it take for us to fall in love with a new and different kind of news site? What would it take for someone to do what, and we were inspired a little bit, I'll have to tell you, by Apple and HBO and Tesla. What would it take for us to reimagine a space that already seems plenty crowded? And I say that meaning that for those of you who don't remember, uh, the computer space was pretty crowded when Steve Jobs returned to Apple in the late 90s. It wasn't immediately obvious that anyone needed a new and different computer company. And yet still with that little colorful iMac and a lot more, they managed to reimagine what was possible there. And for those of you who like me give credit to HBO for kind of kicking off this golden age of television, many of you remember that when HBO finally started getting hot with Sex in the City and a bunch of others, it was not at a time where there were three or four TV channels already by then. I had dozens of choices. But HBO still kind of colorfully reimagined what TV could be. And so in our mind, we thought as crowded as this space may be, there may be a chance to kind of think about this whole thing differently. Four things stood out for us that we thought we had to do in order to become for our target audience, which we often call the change generation. Not the only place that they go for their news information, but we hope they're first and favorite. First, we thought we have to do a good job of catching you up on the big stories of the day, right? We got to do it quick. We got to do it fast, almost as though you were the president. And hence, we created something called the Presidential Daily Brief, which some of you may see when, uh, when you look right here. And I hope some of you are readers of the Presidential Daily Brief. But once we caught you up, we thought the second thing we could do, and maybe the more important thing we could do, is vault you ahead. Could we introduce you to the new and the next, whether that meant new people, new places, new trends, new ideas? Not a minute or an hour ahead like might happen with Twitter, but could we introduce you to people and places and things three months, six months, 12 months before you normally might see it on CNN or you might read about it in the Times? And so not LeBron James or Sheryl Sandberg, but maybe the next LeBron or the next Sheryl Sandberg. And we were inspired in part by Wired. Any of you remember Wired back in the day when Wired first got started? Any Wired fans early on? When Wired first got started, you would read stuff in Wired. I used to sit in Borders Bookstore, for anyone who remembers Borders Bookstore on uh, University Avenue. I used to sit in Borders Bookstore, and you would read stuff in Wired that you would only end up uh, seeing in mainstream publications a year or two later. If there are any music fans here, I would say that's what uh, The Source and Pitchfork uh, used to be uh, like a little bit, where they were clearly ahead of the curve. So that was the second big piece for us. Could we not only catch people up, but vault them ahead? The third thing is we thought that design and style and flavor was no longer just a nice to have, but it was a must have for our target audience. That part of what Apple had done was say that, you know what, for a new generation of people, like whether you've got headsets or thermostats, whether you've got a TV show or a place to eat, they want some style and flavor. And so how we designed, how we wrote, how we filmed, how we edited, whether we sweetened with music, we thought all of that 
was as critical to us as it was to HBO, to Tesla, to others. And so we thought that was the third piece. And then last but not least, we thought not only did we have to catch you up and bolt you ahead and do it with style and flavor, but if we really were going to win over our audience, they would never want to think that they missed out on something because Ozzy was really narrowly focused, that Ozzy was only telling them about the new and the next from the US. They'd want to believe that Ozzy was telling them about the new and the next period. And so Ozzy from the very beginning was really global. Um, if you spend time on Ozzy, you'll end up seeing stories from uh, Morocco and Burkina Faso and Bolivia, as well as from Boston and, uh, and San Francisco. And so those were kind of the four big pieces that we set out with uh, three and a half years ago and hoping that we would build for our target audience, which again, we called the change generation, not the only place they would go for their news, but we hope we would build the first and favorite. Now, uh, uh, take a moment on the change generation that I referred to. Um, often when people hear me say that, they think I'm referring to millennials. And as my mom would always remind me, it was more, she said, the change generation is a mindset. It's more of a psychographic than a demographic. It's people who aren't just okay with things being different, but people who actually often think of different with uh, as a positive connotation, different food, different clothing, different candidate, different uh, different person uh, to spend time with. And so for those folks, we wanted to become their first and favorite, which might mean largely millennials and Gen Xers, but not only. And so that was the journey we began on uh, about three and a half years ago. And to give you a little bit of a demo, uh, the presidential daily brief, as I said, uh, we produce it every day, and it's meant to say here are the kind of top 10 stories. but here on the right and on the left, you'll see usually about a dozen stories each day that we hope introduce you to the new and the next. And whether that's an opinion piece or whether that's a rising star, whether that's a piece from uh, the world of politics or even what we call good shit, <laughs> um, uh, uh, we hope that we're the place that you get a chance to discover the new Daily Show host a year before he's chosen or the first pick in the NFL draft or maybe the first time uh, uh, you read about a new book or a new TV show will be on Ozzy. That's part of what we hope uh, to bring to you. Um, Ozzy's grown um, today about 25 million people every month will read us or watch us or listen to us. Uh, slightly more women than men. Uh, about two thirds here in the US, about a third outside uh, of the US. Um, we've got about 75 people on the team, about 25 here in the Bay Area, 25 elsewhere in the US and 25 around the world. Um, and as we sit here at this moment, I probably would tell you that there are four or five things if I were talking to my younger self that I would say uh, Carlos probably would surprise you um, about this journey. Uh, the first thing I would say is that at my first company when I started, I later on said that maybe one of the most important hires and the hires that you don't appreciate the value of as much is your head of finance, sometimes called your CFO. That until you have a really good one, you never realize how much money um, you can blow through and uh, how unfortunate that can end up being. Um, but I will tell you that one of the interesting uh, challenges and opportunities that I've learned about this time is in many ways the importance of HR. Um, the importance of the people who are in charge of people and culture um, is critical. And I'd say it's even more difficult today than it was when I started my first company. When I started my first company, very few people uh, were entrepreneurs. Uh, you didn't have TV shows like Silicon Valley. Uh, you didn't have movies like The Social Network. You didn't have 500 startups. And so I think there at least was a little more, um, there at least was a little more mystery to what a startup was about. Today, I think so many of us see kind of the handful of companies that win and do well. And we assume a lot of times that it's easier maybe than I think it is. And, I, and as a result, we see the uh, good food and the cool drinks and the games, and we assume that that's at the heart of it. And I would say that it has been, um, uh, it has been humbling uh, to realize that one of the most important things that I have to do as a co-founder and as a CEO is really help people appreciate how much hard work is going to go into it. And that no matter how much hard work we put into it, still relatively few of us are going to end up being meaningfully successful at it. That doesn't mean that we won't try hard, doesn't mean we won't have a good idea, but I like to say they call it 500 startups for a reason, because there's one Airbnb, right? And uh, the other 499 or 400 who knows how many are people who are going to put a ton of time in and probably aren't going to end up exactly where they'd like to be. And so that actually was the first interesting thing, which is that it became really important for us to get some help in helping our team think about what it's like to be part of a startup, what kind of commitment they're making, which may be different than what they see on TV or read about um, or hear about elsewhere. And so 
That was one of the surprises I would point out and that I would say. The second thing I probably would say to my younger self is a lot of times when you hear startup, we talk about the creativity that's involved. We talk about the, uh, the energy. Sometimes we talk about the all-nighters. Uh, we talk about the push. We talk about can you find terrific investors. I would say that one of the skills that I think is absolutely critical and that at least I didn't hear anyone talking about was the importance of being incredibly organized. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I think a lot of us think about startup and we think chaos. And I think the reality is it's hard to get stuff done uh, amidst chaos. And yet those places, I think, that are better organized, that actually follow through, that get things done, that as sim simple as this sound, have agendas and have... Uh, follow-up items and actually tick those things off, I think often disproportionately those are the ones that end up winning. I remember years ago talking to a guy named Bill Campbell. And I don't know, did Bill ever come and speak here as well? Bill, who uh, uh, was advisor to a lot of terrific CEOs from uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page to Jeff Bezos, used to say that the biggest transformation he had seen in the last 25 years of advising CEOs was the number of visionaries who would become superior operators. That as he said, they came to realize that no matter how big and cool their idea was, if they couldn't actually implement it, if they weren't really organized and on top of it and the kind of person who could bring it to life, that it wouldn't come to life, that they couldn't simply hope that someone else was going to do it. And so I would say that would have been the second thing that I would have emphasized. And it's not a skill that you hear talked about um, as much, but I would say that probably uh, was a second surprise. Um, I would say a third thing that I probably would have surprised uh, myself with a little bit is, uh, is the beauty of a great partner. Um, who here has had a really good partner before in sports and love and life and business? Who's had a great partner before? Yeah. Um, uh, I, um, I, I should have known it. <laughs> um, um, I should have known it, but I, but I, and, and I had good partners at my first company, but I learned it all over again. It's um, uh, what's been interesting about this time around at Ozzy is, in effect, I really feel like I probably have two partners. Uh, one partner is Samir Rao, who we started the company together. Um, Samir's from uh, the Detroit, Michigan area. Uh, originally, um, uh, younger guy. Uh, we bumped into each other again. We'd known each other a little bit, but we bumped into each other in the parking lot of a Chipotle. And uh, there began something really good. Um, and our other partner has been a wonderful woman named Louise Rogers, who um, until recently uh, led a um, uh, kind of billion dollar digital company in the UK uh, that just got sold uh, a little bit ago, but started life off as a waitress. And so uh, we've, been a, we've been good partners, even though, and I'd say maybe even because, we have very different approaches. I'd say if you gave Samir uh, and me kind of 10 scenarios and said, um, you guys answer what you would do in these cases. I bet you Samir and I, our answers, even after four plus years together, would only overlap six times. And with Louise, I think we probably would only overlap three times. And that's even after we've worked together a lot. Um, so very different approaches. And yet we have been, I think, um, uh, we've been an incredibly effective uh, uh, partnership. I think uh, there's been an openness to debate I think we've been very willing to allow, for lack of a better term, silver bullets. So if it's clear that this matters to Louise, and we could argue about it forever, but the reality is that that's kind of where she is, and this one really matters to her, we're going to go in that direction. Same with Samir, and hopefully the same with me. But I will tell you that finding, uh, finding that partner, which I don't know that I can really say uh, I can think of as a science, and I don't know that I could give you great advice is, to where to look uh, for that, because it really was a wonderful happenstance in the case of Samir and I um, uh, coming back together again in that parking lot of Chipotle. But, um, but I will tell you that a great partner um, uh, is a blessing. And uh, my, uh, my wonderful fiance says that uh, as I was starting to think about what became Ozzy, I would complain a lot until the day that I bumped into Samir again. And that the minute I bumped into uh, Samir, that the complaining stopped <laughs> and the progress started. And so um, I probably, uh, as someone who was driven and, uh, and, and eager and confident, I probably um, underestimated, or as former President uh, George W. Bush would have said, misunderestimated um, uh, the importance of a, uh, 
the importance of a really good partner. And so that probably was another one of the things that surprised me. Um, last couple of things um, I'll share with you that would have surprised me, and then I'll stop. Um, uh, you know, I don't think of myself as someone, uh, and, and, and maybe it's coming, I, I, I like to think that I'm open and I'm thoughtful and that there's not a ton of hubris. And yet, um, after our first year, we had as good a first year um, as someone could have when we first got started. Um, we, uh, uh, we felt like we launched with a good product. We brought in wonderful investors. Uh, we opened with partnerships with NPR and the USA Today, where we got to do very interesting things with them. Uh, we got a call from Bill Gates, his chief of staff, a couple months in, saying our boss uh, really likes what you guys are doing, and can we send people down? We had all sorts of good things that started to happen right away, and our audience started to jump uh, really quickly in terms of size. And uh, before the year was over, we had, on top of the angel round we had raised, we managed to raise a $25 million round, uh, which was fairly unusual at the time and fairly significant. So we had a great year. Um, uh, and then we punctuated it uh, by absolutely, and I don't know if you can, absolutely just fucking up. <laughs> as great as great a freshman year as we had, and, and maybe some of you guys can relate to that, we had a horrible second, the sophomore year. I mean, uh, it felt like everything that could go wrong did go wrong. We cared about design so much that we decided to redesign uh, uh, our site and our look, and we did it in such a bad way that it literally screwed up um, uh, uh, our back-end um, uh, analytics. Um, and really messed up our traffic growth in really bad ways, uh, not to mention kind of pissing off our users. We went into the market and tried to hire folks who we thought would be, um, would really elevate us to the next level. And on paper, uh, these were really accomplished people. And I know in a lot of other circumstances, they had done well and, and I'm sure still will do well, but those turned out not to be the right hires for us. So we made some hires that um, uh, set us back and on and on again. And so uh, I think another thing I would say to my younger self is the minute that year seems too good to be true, <laughs> be humble enough to, to appreciate that some of it was probably just good old fashioned luck and, uh, and double down afresh. Um, the last thing uh, I will tell you about my entrepreneurial experience, and then I'll pause and, and, uh, and would love to, uh, to take some questions um, as well is, um, I, I really like a blank sheet of paper. I know not everyone else does, and I know sometimes it can be intimidating to think, where do you start and is this right or wrong? But I, I, if you like blank sheets of paper, if you like getting to create something afresh, if that doesn't scare you, but that actually kind of pulls you towards it and you love the idea of kind of building something new that wasn't there uh, before, then I will tell you that being an entrepreneur is one of the most uh, uh, wonderful things possible. There is nothing like going from a blank sheet of paper to a big win. And whether that's um, the site getting launched, uh, whether that's uh, thinking about ways to get people to fall in love and millions of people doing that. Uh, last year, we launched our very first television show, meaning we took some of our digital series and turned it into a television show and sold that. Uh, whether that's been creating an offline experience, meaning a big festival uh, where people who were reading and watching and listening to Ozzy could come in and, and enjoy. Um, all of that has been terrific. And I think as much as I um, could have guessed that I would enjoy it, I think for some of us, there's a particular joy. If that turns out to be you, um, I think uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial uh, opportunities um, could be terrific. Uh, so much more that I could say, but uh, I know I'm supposed to stop and take questions. So that's a little bit about my journey, about some of the things I've learned, but I would love to, uh, uh, to take questions and, uh, and go from there. First of all, Carlos, you know, thank you very much for your talk. And it's very interesting to see you know, like how you go you know, from Stafford and to McKinsey to then working at TV and then like taking the education startup and then now with your with uh, with Zoos. What would you say in your personal life has been like this red thread in your life that has been kept on flavor and constant? Repeat the question. 
Yeah, so, um, so given that I've tried very different things from uh, startups to um, uh, larger places like McKinsey and Goldman to television uh, to now Ozzy, um, what would be kind of a, a thread that brings it all, um, that brings it all together? Um, I, I guess this may sound a little, uh, a little weird, but, but, but probably just a willingness and a confidence to try different things. Um, I, I think a lot of times, any of you guys ever read uh, Paulo Coelho, uh, the author who wrote The Alchemist, a lot of other things? He's got this great bit at the beginning of The Alchemist where he basically says that we often spend so much of our lives trying to not listen to our inner selves and to try and run away from it or to try and shut it down. And whether we shut it down with alcohol, whether we shut it down uh, by going to graduate school that's not really for us but are for our parents, whether we shut it down by doing something else that we're expecting to do, that we spend lots of our life trying to not listen to who we really are and what we really uh, want to do. And I think for whatever combination of reasons, I think for better or worse, I was willing as I became interested, because I think most of us are interested in a variety of things. I mean, I think very few of us are interested in only one thing, right? Like, we could pretend that's true, but like, that's not really true, right? We all have lots of different kinds of music. Some of you probably listen to both Kanye and Sinatra, right? And, and you don't think that's weird. You just think that's kind of who you are and that's kind of what you like. And so I think I was willing to, to try that. I, I honestly think part of my willingness to try new and different things, I often say I, I, I give credit not only to my dad, but to my mom. And, and I've, I've worked a lot with students over the years. I think a lot of us aren't, um, again, going back to Paulo Coelho, aren't always encouraged uh, to kind of pursue our dreams and really kind of believe in ourselves. And there's a little bit of, or a large bit of insecurity that I think that often prevents us from getting out of line, right? And so out of safety, we kind of stay in line and we stay in the herd, whether or not that's really right for us. And I think my mom, who had been a teacher, she was, she was a mother late in life. So um, uh, she got married late and then had four kids between the age of 36 and 41, which in that era would be like saying between 44 and 48 probably today. So uh, I think she'd been a teacher for a long time. And, and I think she appreciated that people learn different ways. And, and, and she was a very affirming person. And so I never take that for granted. And particularly when I work with, uh, with lots of, of um Young people, I realize a lot of people don't have that in their life. So I know that's not exactly the answer you were expecting, um, but, but I think that, that my willingness to, um, uh, to allow life to have some jagged edges and to not treat that as weird, but actually maybe to say that that's maybe a little more real, I, I think came probably from, uh, even though I didn't necessarily come from a wealthy background, um, uh, even though I didn't necessarily come from a family that had a lot of entrepreneurs, or a lot of people who had done TV or any of the kinds of things that sometimes would have made those feel safer and easier to do, I think uh, I think she just did a very good. I mean, a lot of things, but but among the things is I think I was really fortunate to um, uh, uh, to have a mom who just kind of said like, "Go for it." And um, uh, she often would say, like, what's the worst that can happen? She said, I'm going to love you no matter what. She's like, what's the worst that could happen? And so, again, I, I'm very aware that not everyone has had the benefit of that. And, and I'm not saying that's the only reason why I ended up trying these different things, but I'd say that that was part of it. Um, so it, I don't know if that is exactly the answer you were expecting or thinking. Like an acknowledgement of, you know, life goes kind of in zigzags, you know, just like go along with yeah. it and try to... I, I, you know, it's interesting. some of you guys may have heard the wonderful commencement address given maybe a dozen years ago by Steve Jobs here at Stanford. And you see that thing where he talks about when you look at your life in retrospect, uh, you know, a bunch of things may come together from a calligraphy class to, to other things in order to kind of make sense. And obviously, that kind of synthesis doesn't happen for everyone. But, but where it does happen, that's, uh, that's a wonderful thing. So I, I'll tell you, that was... Um, that's probably it. I, but, but a curiosity probably is the other piece too. That, that I've always been that I've always been curious and and like good challenges and 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 like the sense that I'm learning, and and probably felt like whether I was doing a startup or whether I was fortunate enough to be at a place like uh, McKinsey or or whether I was 
uh, uh, hosting shows that I was that was learning. And and I I, I um my mom used to uh, joke they bought back in the day they had encyclopedias, physical encyclopedias, and they had World Book, and uh, people would come door to door and sell those. And uh, she and my dad made a big investment to buy them, and they put them in my room. And she used to say I'd just read them for fun. And so I think I've always kind of uh, had this hunger for um, uh, for learning more and 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 get a lot of joy out of that. And so underlying each of these startups and underlying some of the other work I've done, I'd say that's probably been a part of it. When you were describing your first couple of years with Ozzy, where the first year everything was fantastic and you're on top of the world and then you should hit the fan and all of a sudden everything was going bad. But you stayed with it. You decided not to close the doors and but something drove you through this really dark period to, and, and came through with something that, that's great. What was it that did you ever feel that, okay, this, I can either change horses totally and do something different, or what was it that drove you through that dark period? Uh, you know, I'd probably say two, uh, several things. One, just uh, a love of what we were doing. So, so I am fortunate in that, that I actually genuinely love what we were doing, and, I, and that's probably part of it. Um, and I, always, I still always feel lucky because I know that a lot of people work hard but never actually get to help start something. And so as weird as that sounds, I always feel lucky. And so even when the things aren't going well, I realize that it's not every day someone gets to start something. Um, probably responsibility, knowing that a lot of people had wired real money uh, to us. Uh, a lot of people moved from different parts of the country or world to come join us too. So I, I realize that that can sound um, a little... Uh, at worst, paternalistic, but I do feel like I have a responsibility to people who are, are betting on us, and, and so I feel like I owe something uh, 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 to them. But, you know, I'm kind of I'm naturally competitive, but I'll tell you what, you know where I've been getting a lot of motivation from, even more recently? Sports. I've always loved sports, and, and the number of times, I, and I'm not a, anyone here a New England Patriots fan? I'm not a New England Patriots fan, but those guys inspire me. For those of you who aren't pro football fans, this team over the last 15 years has won the Super Bowl five times. Um, the only people who are in common, not the only, but the main characters who are in common are the owner, uh, the coach, and the star quarterback. Now, you could argue the star quarterback is the greatest of all time, but um, last year they lose their second best player, Rob Gronkowski, right before the playoffs. And do they give up? Do they wave the white flag? Do they say no mas? No, they get a guy who basically didn't play college football, played lacrosse in college, and put him out there. And he's catching a half dozen passes in the Super Bowl, and they're on their way to coming back. And so I, I would say, believe it or not, all of these interesting comebacks in the last year, whether it was the Cleveland Cavaliers, hate to say that here in the Bay Area, but down 3-1, uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the Cubbies, whether it's um, uh, uh, in college basketball, only when a college basketball fan saw Villanova a year plus ago, saw Clemson. And so that also has, has played a role uh, um, too. Also, the last thing I will say is that, and, and when people used to say this to me before, I, I didn't fully believe it, but definitely being older uh, has helped. There are things that uh, when I was in my 20s, the first startup, they would grind my stomach all night. There'd be issues I'd worry about and I wouldn't get sleep for multiple days and I would just struggle with them and they would just they would just cause me the blues. And I think that today with a little more experience and um, being able to maybe see things in a broader context, they don't wear me down in the same way. And so it probably is a little bit like a boxer who, you know, that same blow when uh, that boxer was 18 or 19 might really ring their bell and now for better or worse, um, 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 and so, um, um, but, but, but also, uh, you know, a number of times we've been really fortunate in having unexpected people on our team step up. Um, one of the best people we've hired was a guy, you know, we've, we've hired a lot of journalists who came from classic backgrounds, New York Times, The Economist, CNN. We've hired some that have come from alternative backgrounds, Vice, GQ. But some of the best people we've hired are people I call cross trainers. Um, uh, one guy had never been a journalist before. He was a board lawyer in a small town in North Carolina, and he has ended up, no one else would have taken a chance on him, he, a guy named Sean Braswell, he's ended up writing some of our best pieces 
And in fact, two of our first three television shows have been based on things that he's written. Another guy we just hired was an accountant for a restaurant chain in New Jersey. And um, um, he loved what we were doing. Uh, he pursued us for probably three, four, or five months. He ended up writing about a dozen freelance pieces. And when we finally met him, we were like, are you willing to take a pay cut? Are you willing to move? Are you willing to lean in and kind of learn this craft and make it work? And he was, and he's ended up being terrific for us. So the other thing I think that probably also helped me get through was just seeing how hard uh, other people uh, were pushing and feeling like, uh, I mean, I, hopefully I would have done my part no matter what, but, but, but definitely I couldn't let them do it, and I'm not, I'm not doing my part. So. Okay. Uh, of the things you've done, uh, that's the location, you know, Los Angeles, uh, Palo Alto, China, India. Does that matter for the things that you're trying to do? Or you can do it anywhere and all that. Uh, what, what's your assessment? You know, that's a, that's a great question. So we're based here in Mountain View. We're based locally. And a lot of people have seen that as a, um, uh, as a bad idea. Um, um, a lot of folks have said, as a media company, you'd want to be where the New York Times and where Vice and Vox and BuzzFeed and NPR and others are, so likely New York or, um, uh, or DC, or at worst, you might want to be in San Francisco or Oakland. And we originally were here, uh, honestly, uh, uh, because my mom lived here and I needed to be, to be close, but I don't know. I love Mountain View. You know, they always joke that I'm I should be president of the Chamber of Commerce because I'm such a big fan. And I actually, I, I, I always wanted, you know, even um, after um, things changed and, and if I wanted to, I could have I left the area, I kind of wanted our team to be here because I felt like if we were in New York, they would always compare themselves with Vice and Vox and BuzzFeed and New York Times. And I actually wanted their competitive set to include Apple and Tesla and Snap and Uber and others. And so I wanted them to really think big and to be open. And I wanted the people who they were bumping into at dinner and at parties and at other places to include that set and not just the other set. So um, I often admire what happened at ESPN, um, which started in a little middle of nowhere, uh, no disrespect to Connecticut, but Bristol, Connecticut, which uh, is not exactly a bustling metropolis. But that's where they built for what was, has been for a time the most successful TV network. And I don't necessarily think that's an accident. And so, um, yes, I think a lot of times we would have an easier time recruiting. Um, we'd have fewer issues with commuting and those sorts of things. But I like being in Silicon Valley. I like being somewhere different. And I think in many ways it keeps us different and it makes us bolder and it makes us consider crazy ideas that turn into television shows or festivals or other sorts of things uh, that I think we otherwise wouldn't have done because that's not what the most natural competitive set uh, was doing. I think we've been less followers and more leaders because we're, uh, I don't want to call Mountain View the wilderness, but, um, um, but, uh, but we're, uh, we're, not on, uh, we're not on the same path. So I think that's been important. One more question. Okay. How does Ozzy make money and how does that compare to traditional media? Great. So a lot of the folks you know, whether it's the Huffington Post or uh, Bleacher Report or uh, Mashable or Business Insider or uh, Vox or, um, or others of the di new digital media players have made money with advertising. And they call it different things at times. They call it branded content or sponsorship or they've got all sorts of kind of clever names, but the bottom line is they're trying to get P&G and Kraft and other people to spend advertising uh, dollars with them. And I think that's a fine business and obviously Google and Facebook have proven that <laughs> ad dollars you can build a nice business uh, based on that. Um, we have uh, uh, done that and worked with a lot of good advertisers, be they Netflix or Spotify or Hulu or others who, who advertise uh, on Ozzy. Um, but two other ways. Um, one, as I mentioned to you before, we started getting calls from Hollywood about a year after we launched. And people were saying, we like these series. Have you ever thought about them as a TV show or movie? Uh, first time we heard that, we got super excited. And I went to go see some of the guys I knew at Vice. And they were like, calm down. Um, uh, I know you're excited, but they whispered the same sweet nothings to us. and We didn't get our first big TV show for 17 years, so it's probably not going to happen. Um, but we still decided to go have the conversations with people and got really lucky and sold our very first show and uh, subsequently have, uh, have sold two other shows. And so television revenue is kind of a second way. And then 
A third way is we do these pretty detailed reader surveys at the end uh, of every year. And within our first year, we started hearing from readers and viewers who said, they didn't use this language. They said, I, li I love Ozzy online, but I almost wish I could meet Ozzy in the real world. And, um, and so at first we started, we started to think about doing small events in the way that Fortune and The Economist and uh, The Atlantic and others have done Recode TechCrunch. And so we started thinking about doing small events. But a really smart woman who worked for the city of New York was like, guys, you're not being ambitious enough. She said, South by Southwest used to be this incredible thing. It's become a little overrun, a little sprawly. Why don't you aim higher and build something of greater scale that not right away, but over time, may be thought of one day as the new South by Southwest. And so we made a five-year commitment to the city of New York to build something called Ozzy Fest, um, which is a wonderful festival. If any of you are in New York this summer in July, uh, the 22nd and 23rd, it was described last summer as, uh, uh, I think the Times called it Ted Meets Coachella. And so it's a really nice mix of uh, musicians and actors and athletes and entrepreneurs and and others, and um, and so that's become quite a revenue uh, source for us. So um, um, there are three revenue sources for Ozzy uh, so far, which we're excited about. Which the only other player who's uh, among the new players who are doing that is Vice, that has multiple revenue sources. Most of the other ones, from BuzzFeed to HuffPo to um, uh, Vox and Mike and Skim, and those mainly are advertising. Um, and so we're hopeful that even though it was harder to uh, really get each of these things going early on, that we're hopeful over the next four or five years that we'll be proud of the fact that we built good roots um, uh, from the very beginning. So uh, thank you guys so much. What a treat. It was good to be with you. I hope it was helpful. Thank you.